Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd. On this episode of The History of Hull, we're going to be taking a look at the history of the town walls. So we start this episode here, next to Hull's amazing flood defence, the Tidal Barrier, which has just had a very busy workout over Storm Kira. But that's not why we're here. We're here because I'm standing on the spot where Hull's walls start, right at the join of what would have been the mouth of the River Hull, where it meets the Humber. And you can kind of see that here except it's been built out since we've reclaimed a lot of land on both sides of the river but this used to be the spot where the Humber estuary started and the river Hull finished. Now you would have thought that the town would have been granted the right to have walls by Edward I when he decided to turn the small port town of Wyke on Hull into his own king's town but no Despite the fact that his frequent military efforts in Scotland painted a bullseye on the face of pretty much every town in the north of England for Scottish reprisals, it took until the reign of his son, Edward II, in 1321 for the town to be granted the right to crenellate. But when they were given that right, they were also given the right to levy a toll, a toll that was called murage. And it was about a penny in the pound for every piece of trade that was coming through the town. And this was to go towards a fund to help them build a wall. It frequently proved inadequate and several other murage levies were placed upon the town. But eventually, and with heavy donations from the Delapole brothers, the wall was eventually built. We don't have to go far on our walk along the walls to come across the first gate here at Queen Street, the Mamhole Gate. And you might think it's an unusual place to have a gate opening out onto the Humber foreshore, but the Mamhole Gate was there for a reason. It basically opened onto a spit of land that was known as the Mamhole, and it was a dumping ground, a place where people would bring household refuse and um, less savoury things to be dumped, to be washed away when the tide of the Humber washed over them. But in later years, the amount of silt that was building up around the manhole turned it from nothing more than a mud bank into an actual substantial piece of the land. And the manhole gate was renamed Humber Gate and the land was used as a cannon battery. And that was uh, done sometime in the 14th or 15th century but its original use was indeed as a tip. Now the town wall, such as it would have been, would have run along here, along Humber Street, but it wasn't a town wall originally in the sense that you might have thought of a medieval defensive structure, because the first town wall built between 1321 and 1330 was actually nothing more than a big ditch and the earth taken from that ditch was piled up next to it to make a big embankment. And on top of that big embankment would have been a timber wall, a palisade. And every so often, like with the manhole gate behind me, you would have had a break in that wall and a gate. But obviously that's not a suitable defense for a medieval town. What they had to do was to rebuild that wall in something a little more sturdy. And normal medieval towns obviously used to go with big hewn blocks of stone. And when people see the remains of Hull's town walls, they often think it was a Tudor invention because the remains of the town walls are in brick. 
And that's weird because brick didn't start to become very popular until the 15th and 16th centuries. But Hull was a bit of a pioneer in this area. Our brick walls do indeed date from the 14th century. And the reason for that is we actually were one of the few places in England that actually had a brickyard capable of building that many bricks. In fact, the brickyard was owned by William Delapole and was situated just to the north of the city. And it does mean that Hull has some of the earliest known examples of brick medieval architecture in England, including the walls and, of course, parts of the Holy Trinity Church, now Hull's Minster. So this first stretch of the walls, and this is why I've started down here, all the way from here right down Humber Street towards the tidal barrier in the distance. This was the first stretch of the walls to be rebuilt in brick. And the reason for this is quite obvious. It was right up against the River Humber. And the Humber, as we know even now, is quite prone to topping its banks when there's a storm. And that would have been even worse in the Middle Ages. Now, a lot of this land has been built up, so it's higher. But in those days, it would have been quite low lying and very prone to flooding. And a brick wall would certainly have given some delivery from that uh, constant flooding. So this would have been the southwest corner of the walls. From here, they would have stopped heading westward and started heading north along what's now Humber Dock Street. And in this corner, we find the very first of the four biggest gates in and out of Hull, the Hesel Gate. And it was one of the two biggest. This and North Gate were mighty imposing structures that were actually built over the ditch that surrounded the walls would have been quite an impressive structure. So this whole stretch of the wall that would have run here along the side of the Humber Dock and along Humber Street itself back there were demolished during the construction of Humber Dock itself. And the reason for that was, even though it wasn't actually in the dock, they still needed all this space for warehouses and dock equipment. But they were also building out the foreshore they used a lot of the material that was excavated from Humber Dock to actually build out a lot of the ground forward from Humber Street on the banks of the Humber. The place where a statue of William Delapole now stands would have actually been in the water itself in the Middle Ages. So we lost a lot to the Victorian development. And unfortunately, it was before the Victorians started getting all gooey about medieval remains would have been maybe a different thing had they been developing the docks in the 1890s. And right here, just across the road there, you'll see Blanket Row. And at the bottom of Blanket Row in the town walls would have been what's known as a Poston Gate. A Poston Gate is a very small gateway in a medieval wall. Not like the big gates, which were giant affairs with portcullises and double doors. This would have been just a small hole in the wall, big enough for a single person to walk through. And the reason for that is it granted easy access to the fields and the lands that would have been outside here, because this would have still been the hamlet of Mighton in those days, full of farmland. But it also was easy to block up in the event of a siege to stop people from using it to get access to the city. And as you'll see, there are several more Poston Gates on our journey on the way around the town. So this would have been the location of the Mighton Gate, one of the four big entrances in and out of the town walls. And it's long gone now, the A63 stands right over it, but the road is still known in this stretch as Mighton Gate. And this is probably a good place to talk about Hull's underlying archaeology. You see, most towns that were lived in in the medieval times have a kind of wiggle room for development because of sedimentary layers burying the medieval stuff deep underground. York, for instance, has medieval finds that go down to almost eight metres. But because of Hull's geology and its closeness to a floodplain, we don't have that. Our medieval remains lie on average about half a metre under the ground, which means that any development, including a major development like a huge road, is going to destroy completely 
any underlying medieval archaeology. And sadly, that's what's happened to Mightengate. It's completely gone, obliterated by the roadwork. So as we leave behind the tragically demolished and destroyed and erased from existence Mightengate, we travel further along our walk around the town walls as we go up Princess Dock Street. Now the stretch along here was the last stretch to actually be demolished. And it was demolished sometime in the 18-teens. We know this because it's not there on a map that shows Queen's Dock in place and Humber Dock in place, but not Prince's Dock. So we know it was demolished before Prince's Dock was actually built. It may even have been demolished when the Humber Dock was being built. But these massive warehouse buildings that still stand along the old dockside pretty much occupy the space where the town wall would have been. And this would have been an interesting stretch of the town wall. There's another Poston Gate just up here, but outside, which would have been where Princess Key is now, stood Hull's Meat Market, as well as quite a number of small houses that have been built as Hull's population started to slowly spill outside of the town walls. So we've talked a little bit about the smaller gates, the Poston gates, that poked through the wall between the main gates. And here's a street that lay at the end of one of those Poston gates. And it's actually called Poston Gate. And as we come to the end of Princess Dock Street, we approach probably the most important gate in the town's walls, the Beverly Gate. This stood at the end of Whitefra Gate so named because of the White Friars, the monks that lived just on the south side of White Frigate. It's, the Beverly Gate is also the only part of the town wall that you can actually see. And this would have been a really, really important feature of the town walls because whilst it wasn't as bulky as Northgate or Heselgate or as well defended, it was the most symbolic. It was the big gate, it was the gate that linked you to the town of Beverly, which was the next biggest town in the whole area. And it would have had a spire on the top in the Middle Ages, a spire that was lost sometime before the Tudor era, because as we can see from the Tudor map makers, there's no spire there, but it does look a little bit truncated, as if something is missing. Now, if you know anything at all about Hull's history, you may know that we played a not insignificant part in sparking the Civil War. And it was here at the Beverly Gates that one of the key events that set the whole Civil War in motion took place. It was happened in 1642. The King, Charles I, had come with his entourage to inspect the port city. Only inside the city, Sir Hotham had reluctantly sided with Parliament and he refused to allow him in. And what I love about the story of this is the human element of this, because the story goes that at 4pm, the King, losing his patience, demanded entrance and said, I'm coming back in an hour and if you don't let me in, there'll be trouble. And he literally went away to a local house to have tea. And an hour later came back and demanded entrance again. And when Hotham said no this time, the king stamped his feet and went to Beverly in a sulk. And shortly after that, the first siege of Hull began. Now, in the lead up to the Civil War, Hull and its fortifications gained some serious upgrades. The walls were basically renovated and extra earthwork ditches were built around the entire wall network. Cannon emplacements were placed outside each of the main gates. And of course, all the small postern gates were blocked up. You couldn't have easy access coming in. The first siege of Hull was not overly terrifying for the inhabitants because the king had a fairly insignificant number of people who weren't actually that good at waging war. 
they just locked the gates and endured a few cannonballs and the king wandered off after a, a short while. The second siege came in 1643 and was a little more intense. This time things were a little bit more pivotal in the English Civil War itself. But Hull had an ace up its sleeve in terms of its overall defence. You see, it was already known as one of the most impregnable city fortresses in the whole of England. And one of the reasons for that was the fact that it could use the rivers as part of its defence. There were giant sluice gates from the rivers that could be opened, that would flood the low-lying areas around the city, causing it to have effectively a giant moat. And with cannonball technology being what it was in the 17th century, most of the energy of the cannonballs had been spent by the time they'd flown across so much water. Thus, the town walls managed to escape serious damage during both sieges. Now many town walls were built in the medieval period, but not that many actually saw sieges. Hull was one of the few that actually saw some serious military action. It was pounded by cannonballs from the Royalist forces during the Civil War on two occasions, two separate sieges. And still it stood. Okay, one part of it fell down, but that may have been undermined by the water and the cannon weights. And... But they soon patched it back up and it was fine. It was fine. So this stretch of the walls along Guildhall Road was the first casualty of industrialisation. When Hull's business was starting to increase and the old harbour was starting to become ridiculously overpopulated with ships and trade, a dock needed to be built. And the most obvious place to build the dock was by extending the ditch that had surrounded the town walls. And that meant that the town walls themselves were going to have to go. Now this was 1770s. This wasn't the much more sympathetic later Victorian era. They just tore them down. All the way from the Beverly Gate right up to the North Gate. The rest of the stretch we're going to walk along. It's all gone. And it's all been gone for a very long time. And in its place... Queen's Dock, formerly The Dock, later The Old Dock when they built a new dock, and now Queen's Gardens. So here, at Lowgate, we find another Purston Gate that would have been in the wall between the big gates of the North Gate and the Beverly Gate. And obviously, another one that would have been closed off in times of war. And you can actually see Straight down there you've got Marketplace and Lowgate and St Mary's Church, all part of old medieval Hull. Now it's at this point that I perhaps need to issue an apology and a correction because I got some stuff wrong in the History of Hull Docks episode 1. I said that Edward III had started the building of Hull Castle. Now with history research one of the things you're not supposed to ever do is only rely on one source. Guess what I did? Yeah, and it was an old source and quite heavily outdated, so it was wrong. Edward III and possibly Richard II did add to the town's defences. They certainly put money in to try and shore up the defences, expecting an invasion from the French. But the tower that they built on the east bank of the River Hull was actually only a fairly small one, and it was just at the mouth of the river. The castle was actually built by Henry VIII, and it was that that Henry VIII had built after the pilgrimage of grace to try and stamp his authority on the rebellious people of Hull. And finally, as we get to the end of the north walls, we find ourselves at the very end of Hull's historic town walls. Right here, in fact, where the old dock offices used to be, stood the North Gate, which was one of the biggest and sturdiest and most well defended of the town's gates. And you might think it's a bit odd to have the most defended gate up here, right next to the river, 
But there is a good reason for that because this was also the least well defended area. It was the weak point in the whole wall. You see, because of problems with the soil on the banks of the River Hull, they couldn't build the brick wall all the way to the bank. It was just sloppy, horrid, slippy mud. And every time they did try, it subsided and slipped and fell down. So the wall just on the eastern side of the North Gate really consisted of nothing more than a big mound of mud, which was fairly easy to get over if you were of a persistent mind. So what they did instead to shore that up was to build an enormous gate that stretched across the ditch and could uh, allow crossbowmen and people pouring boiling water to rain merry hell on anyone who tried to get across the ditch and into that weak spot. But fortunately, in later years, in the 1530s, when King Henry VIII visited Hull in order to stamp his authority on the rebellious people of the town after the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, he decided to put a lot of money into Hull's defences, including the building of the aforementioned castle on the east bank. He also put a lot of money into renovating the town's walls and towers. And finally, the wall was built out to meet the river. And that is the end of the story. And this marks the end of my walk around Hull's historic town walls. Town walls that were built in the 14th century and yet resisted 17th century weapons far better than some of their contemporaries that were built of stone. An impregnable fortress city was made using these walls. Magnificent gates and a fantastically prosperous, incredibly prosperous town bustling within. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you really liked the video, please feel free to visit the links below to my Patreon and GoFundMe pages.